Dr. Isom, and I'm back. Now that we've talked about projective personality tests, let's talk about objective personality tests, which are by far the most common kind of personality test used in personality research. All right, so let's talk about the definition. What is the definition, or what makes a personality test an objective test? Well, if you have a test and it asks you a question, and your response choices are anything like this, yes or no, true or false, or some sort of Likert type response that you indicate the number that you agree with a statement, either about yourself, if it's a self-report, or about someone else, if it's an informant report. And that scale includes a lower number like zero or one, which indicates that the statement is not at all true, to something like seven or eight, which indicates the statement is very true. So a Likert type response scale, these are all indications that you are looking at an objective personality test. What makes the test objective though? Why the word objective? Well, I've heard two different arguments. The first one is that the scoring is objective. So the way that you score someone's responses on an objective personality test are not interpreting them or looking at some sort of qualitative analysis of responses. You're simply just going to add up the number of yes or no true or false, or Likert type items that measure the personality characteristics that you're interested in, and you get a numerical score. And usually those scores are normed so that you have a sense of how that person's score compares to the general population. So the scoring is objective. It's just a matter of doing some math, adding up or averaging items that make up a measure of that personality characteristic. But I've also heard it argued that the thing that makes objective personality tests objective is that the questions themselves seem to be more objective and less open to interpretation. Now that is arguably not always true because sometimes you'll have items that have very strange wording or wording that requires you to agree with two different statements. Those would be called double-barreled items. But the idea is that because the questions are more straightforward, they're not ambiguous, like in projective tests, they are more objective. And that is why we would call this an objective personality test. Here's some examples of items that you might find on an objective test. And you know these are objective because the response choices are simply true or false. Here's something interesting about objective tests. They usually have a lot of items. Why would they have a lot of items? Well, there are multiple reasons for this. If you have an omnibus or a multidimensional personality test like the NEO PI3, which is measuring the five factors, you're simply gonna have a lot of items because you're measuring five different traits. So I think the NEO has something like 180 items. Another one that has a lot of items is the MMPI or the MMPI2. 567 true false questions. That takes a long time to finish. Why would these tests have so many items? Well, if you think back to classical test theory, that anything that you measure is going to have not only that person's true answer for the question, but it's also gonna have a degree of error. And when we're talking about personality test items, Items themselves are going to be interpreted slightly differently depending on who the person is. And so that slightly different interpretation, even if the items are worded in a very straightforward, quote, objective way, that slight interpretation difference is going to introduce a little bit of error. The idea is that the more questions you have measuring the same construct or trait, the more likely any error that's associated with misinterpreting any of those items is going to be averaged out. When you combine all of your answers for the items measuring a particular construct, or if you average all of those items that are measuring a particular construct, whether you sum the items or you average the items, that depends on the way that that personality test is scored. But when you do that, you're going to average out or eliminate any bias or any error associated with any one item. And the more items you have, the higher likelihood you are to average out error that might be present in any one of the items. This idea that you measure the same thing many times is called aggregation. You can either measure the same construct with multiple items, or you can measure that same construct with a personality test over multiple occasions. So there's different ways to aggregate, but the bottom line in aggregation is that you're combining scores for the construct or the trait that you wanna measure, 
And combining those scores, averaging them or summing them, allows any error that's associated with any one measurement or any one item to be reduced. That's one of the reasons why you'll see personality tests, particularly objective personality tests, often have a large number of items. That's not always the case, but usually they have a lot of items. Another benefit of objective personality tests is that most of these tests are normed so that when you get that score for an individual, you can determine how that person's score compares to other people that are like them demographically and whether their score is higher or lower or about the same as the average. Here's an example of part of an objective test that has a Likert type format. You'll see that for any particular question like I work well with others, for example, you can choose any of those answers from strongly disagree to strongly agree. That Likert type format is an indication of your agreement or your general opinion of yourself for that question. Okay, so there's true, false, there's yes or no, there's Likert type responses on objective tests. Here's just another example of a question from an objective personality test that uses the Likert type format for the participant's response. You might be familiar with this Likert type response format if you've ever been in the ER or if you've ever been in the ER with somebody and they have had to respond to a pain scale. When you're in a great deal of pain, it's hard to respond sometimes. So this type of response format simply allows them to pick the face that corresponds with how they're feeling. Alternately, all they have to do is mark their agreement on the line, and then the person who's giving the test just has to measure the length of the line. Another type of question that you see on objective tests is the forced choice response. And that's where you have a statement, and then you have a limited number of answers that the person can choose from. This is a pretty simple way and quick way of getting responses from a participant. But it's not really ideal because one of the issues that it potentially brings up is that the person's actual response choice may not be one of the response options. For example, on this one, it's possible that a person's first choice for socializing with others, at least these days, is E, having a Zoom meeting. So that's an example of how these forced choice items may not be the most valid way to ask questions. Something that is an issue with objective personality tests more than projective personality tests is response biases. One of the most important ones in personality research, and I mentioned this in an earlier lecture, is social desirability. Social desirability is an issue when you're asking somebody questions about themselves, and if they answer honestly, they're afraid that they might appear to have qualities that are not socially desirable. In other words, they don't really want to tell the truth because they're afraid it might make them look bad. So if you're asking about maybe how anxious a person is or how much underage drinking do they do, the person might be motivated not to tell you the truth because they wouldn't want the test administrator or the person who's giving the test to think less highly of them if the true answer is not an answer that is a socially desirable or socially acceptable answer. Other biases that can happen with objective tests include just simply carelessness. When you give somebody a paper and pencil test or a link and they complete a test online, if the person isn't really motivated to answer the questions carefully, particularly if the experimenter or the researcher isn't there with them when they're taking the test, they might go through the questions quickly, they might fail to read them fully, and their answers will be affected and possibly less accurate as a result. This is more of an issue with objective tests because with projective tests, you have the experimenter or the researcher right there one-on-one -on -one with the individual. So they're going to be less likely to be careless in their responses. Another source of bias is response acquiescence. This is also called yay saying or the opposite, which is nay saying. And this can happen, for example, if you are giving a personality test to somebody or doing a research study and your participant or your subject really, really wants to do well or show you that they're smart or show you that they have a very sociable personality, whatever the motivation is, they will tend to agree with the responses on an objective test more than they disagree. So there's this bias towards agreeing with the questions or scoring the questions more highly. The alternate or the vice versa of that is where you have a participant who really doesn't want to be in the study or for whatever reason is more likely to respond negatively to all of the questions. One of the ways you can get around this is to reverse score. 
some of your questions. So instead of having your questions all in one direction, I like going to parties, I like to have a lot of friends, you would phrase the question in the reverse. I do not like to go to a lot of parties. And if you notice that the individual still is showing a high level of agreement with all of the items, it'll be apparent because you'll see conflicting responses to questions that are asking the same thing, just one is asking it in a reverse way. The next thing that I'll be talking about is the three methods for creating objective tests. But first, when we're creating items for any kind of the objective tests, there are some issues that we need to think about, and specifically these are four conditions that are required for items to be valid on objective tests. The first one is that the item that is created must mean the same thing to both the test creator and the taker. So the statement, I believe white lies are never okay to tell. There has to be a shared understanding of terms like white lies. What is a white lie? In creating that item, you need to make sure that that phrase, white lie, is something that the person who's taking the test will understand in the way that the test creator meant it. The second thing is that the person taking the test must be capable of answering that item honestly. So that means the person who's taking the test has to be capable of accurately assessing themselves. So if the test taker answers, oh, I never think it's okay to tell white lies, but actually that person does tell white lies, as research has found most people do to maintain social relationships in our culture, and the person is just not aware of it because they don't have the self-insight, then that won't be an accurate self-assessment. This condition also comes up if you have somebody who has not developed the ability to accurately self-assess. In the case of somebody with narcissistic personality disorder, they may think that they are highly empathic because, for example, they will tell you they listen to people's problems all the time, but the truth is they don't have the ability to experience empathy or to be empathic to somebody. Then that's another example of how the test taker won't be capable of an accurate self-assessment. The third condition is that the test taker must be willing to make an accurate self-report. If you're asking things that may reflect negatively on the test taker, they may not be willing to give you an accurate report. If you're asking about something like underage drinking or some kind of illegal behavior or whether they've ever cheated in a relationship, Things that wouldn't reflect well on the respondent are the kind of things that people might not be willing to accurately report to you just because they don't want to tell you. The second condition is a situation where the person's not able to tell you and in number three, they're not willing to tell you. They don't want to tell you. The last one, and this is pretty basic, is that the items that are created for the test need to be valid measures of the construct that they're trying to measure. So if you're trying to measure honesty, then you need to make sure that whatever that item is, it is measuring honesty and not anxiety or anger or extroversion or some other construct. One of the things that is an issue in objective personality tests is that second condition, that the test taker must be capable of accurate self-assessment. This is an issue because sometimes if you've never been in a specific situation, you're not going to know how you would respond. You may feel that you have a really good understanding of how you probably will respond or you might be sure that you're going to respond in a certain way, but that's never a given. So when asking questions about hypothetical situations and how a person would respond, we need to be really careful about what we ask because people don't always have that self-insight. Hopefully this lecture has given you a better understanding of just what objective personality tests are and how they differ from projective tests. Next lecture, I will talk about the methods for creating objective personality tests.